record. Um, and I'm going to share my slideshow with you. Um, yesterday, I did a lot of the talking, right? But today, I am going to, um, hopefully, I'm going to, oh my gosh, I always press the wrong thing. Um, play from current slide, custom show, present, it should be presenter view. There we go, all right. Um, today, I'm hopefully going to give you the floor to experiment a little bit with the things that we did yesterday. Um, so before that, though, I know so, a couple people weren't here yesterday that have joined us today. Um, so I just want to do a quick review. So I realized yesterday I talked about SWABOTs, students will be able to. Those, that's an accessible way to craft your objective, right? I didn't actually craft the objectives this way because you're not really students, right? Your attendees. Um, so our objective today is the same as yesterday. Attendees will explore online assessment options and share their own ideas and approaches for assessing students work online. And today we're gonna focus more on you sharing your ideas for assessment. We have our volunteer assistant. Um, I'm actually going to skip the Zoom poll. I've moved that later. Sorry. We're going to do a review of yesterday's methods in which first I'll talk about them and then you're going to experiment with them. And finally, we're going to debrief um, through writing. <clears throat> so yesterday, hold on. Uh, did I remember to record the meeting? Let's check. I didn't remember to the, record the meeting. Okay, that's good. Uh, play from current slide. So yesterday, we discussed formative and summative assessments. Um, so these are two different approaches to assessment. Who can... Um, of the people who were here yesterday, who can just briefly explain to the folks who had to be absent yesterday, what are these things? What is the difference between formative and summative assessment? May I do it, please? Mark, Catherine. Uh, I heard Ahmed first. So Ahmed, yeah. you go ahead. And then um, who else spoke? Hussein. Hussein, maybe could you do the... Um, the example. Okay, we are after. going to divide the, the two types. I'm going to talk about formative assessment. Okay, perfect. Okay, with formative assessment, we, we talk about something just to be done as an activity within a lecture or within if, if it is to be a lesson in which we have uh, an online activity. Uh, we, we make some sort of uh, uh, a quiz or a short evaluation that is to, uh, I mean, to check students' understanding for for the material presented. So it is, it is, uh, uh, let me say, a short quiz or an activity in which we are going to check what is presented earlier in in, in a lecture or in a lesson. Is that great. okay? Yeah, that was a great explanation. Um, I'll say it doesn't only have to be quizzes, right? It can also be observing your students, right? Just watching how they're doing in the course, but yes. Um, and Hussein, do you want to explain summative assessments? Yes, summative assessment, uh, like uh, uh, final exam, midterms, or oh, dissertations, theses, comprehension exams. Uh, these uh, that's concerned with summative assessment. Yeah. Wonderful. So uh, uh, we can make more than one uh, types of questions. And for example, I say open end questions, multiple choice, true, false, correct the answer. We have more than one types of uh, questions that can make in final exam, for example, or uh, in uh, mid terms, whatever, comprehension exam. This is that's concerned with summative assessment. Meanwhile, formative assessment that's concerned with the month, uh, monthly exam and a quiz, and that's it. Perfect. May I comment? Yes. 
yeah, uh, formative uh, ongoing of an observing and maybe ungraded or informal. But summative, it is uh, uh, formal and graded at the completion of the course or task. Uh, for the uh, formative, uh, maybe a student at the end of the semester may be ability to do something. But uh, summative, for example, in the middle uh, mid term or uh, final exam, uh, we have uh, graded all the students. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So it's not. So just to clarify, as you said, formative assessments aren't always quizzes and tests. Actually, this. So if you're imagining that you're my students, uh, just for example, um, this conversation that we're having now is a type of formative assessment, right? Because by you answering these questions, you're demonstrating to me, okay, I understand what formative and summative assessment is. Um, so it doesn't have to be an official quiz. Uh, formative assessments are often informal activities and we're observing how our students do. Perfect. Actually, um, anyone... mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> Yes. Uh, actually, whenever you uh, whenever you ask uh, whenever you are checking uh, the student's comprehension on any topic, actually you are doing assessment. So regardless of what, <laughs> I mean, every single comprehension question you are asking, whether you are meaning to assess them or not, but you are assessing them. Yeah, it's the over time you have a general sense of your students, right? okay, this student is really strong in this area, but needs more help in this area. That's, you've gained that insight through observation and through working with your um, students. Emma, no, I'm sorry. The cat is trying to eat my book. Um, all right, let's go. So yeah, yesterday, formative assessments, we talked about having accessible teaching objectives, monitoring your students, asking comprehension, comprehension check questions, which in communicative language teaching, we often abbreviate as CCQs. Um, taking quizzes and polls like Kahoot, which we did yesterday, having exit slips and self-assessments, uh, asking students to report back if they go off into group or pair work and um, allowing students to ask questions, right? Students' questions will tell you a lot about what they still need to know. Um, so this is what we talked about yesterday concerning formative assessments in summative assessments online. And this is, I think, where people were asking for a little bit of help of I need to have a grade for my students at the end of my semester um, that is viable, um, that is trustworthy, and that can speak to their ability to move on to the next course in my sequence or to graduate from this program um, or inform their grade point average or GPA. So we discussed yesterday some options like personalization randomization, online proctoring, and plagiarism de detectors. Um, so I would love it if four different people might kind of briefly recap, what is this strategy? Um, Sadiq, could you, you can choose one and then explain, and then Wafa, I saw your hands raised. And actually, this is really wonderful. I love it when you raise your hands because when I'm sharing my slides in full screen mode, I can't see all of you and I don't necessarily know who's talking, but if you raise your hand, I get a little notification. Um, and you should be able to raise your hand by clicking an icon at the bottom of your screen. Does anybody else need, does anybody need help seeing where the raise hand button is? Okay, great. So, um, Sadiq, uh, why don't you go first and then Wafa, yeah. um, you can Thank follow. Thank you. Uh, I'll go through personalization. Um, sometimes use it in, um, in um, doing the questions or raising the questions. Uh, we use um, terms such as according to your point of view, 
um, what do you think? So um, we give broad space for the um, um, examiners, for the students to put their own, own point of view or their own decision on something. So we are not asking for something um, textual, but we need um, the uh, student to answer using his or her own uh, words. And this is called personalization. Perfect, yes. Um, that was a great explanation. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, I wanna just add a piece of clarification about personalization. Personalization doesn't necessarily mean that it's about your students' lives, right? In language teaching, like if you're teaching someone how to speak or read or write in a second language, it often does, right? Write, write about your family or um, what did you do this weekend? Those are personalized questions. But even um, in microbiology, you can ask questions that rely on personalization when they're asking students to share their own interpretation of data. Um, so, and actually I was reading through your questions um, and answers that you wrote out at the beginning of yesterday's session. And um, I think it was Mahmoud had a really nice example of personalization. And we're gonna look at that later, um, later on today. Um, Wafa, would you mind doing randomization or did you wanna talk about personalization? I just want to add to personalization, just one example that I, that, that I do with my students. I usually give a quotation where, it, where they can have more than, it can you know, accept more than one idea. So I quote from, from somewhere, I mean, from a book and I will tell them, well, according to what we have studied, what do you think? So they apply their own ideas and opinions. So they relate. That's a great example. And you can do that across any field as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, any field, right? Even science and mathematics, you can ask students to apply their opinion to a process. Um, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so shall I go to randomization? Yeah, if you don't okay. mind. Yeah, uh, well, uh, which means uh, you, you shuffle the questions and you shuffle the answers for each question in order to, you know, to avoid this is answering instead of giving their answers because even if they give their answers to other students it's not going to be in the same order that they appear to everybody it will be it will be shuffled uh, the questions will be shuffled and the answers will be shuffled too but shuffling the question will uh, will not be uh, a good idea if your exam uh, the questions were in sections because the sections will be you know integrated together and it will be a total mess so you should you know think of that that point only and thank you Awesome, great. Yeah, and I will add that for the final thing that you mentioned, that's particularly for Google Forms. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, because there are other, um, each learning management system has its own platform for making questions. And they're, they often have very different uh, setups and features. So Google Forms is what we talked about the most yesterday, uh, and that is definitely a concern with Google Forms. So, thank Sorry, you. Miss Catherine, may I say something? Yes, who Sorry are you? Sorry for interruption. Who, who saying, are you? Who's saying, go ahead. Yes, sorry for interruption, but uh, my colleague mentioned uh, shuffled questions. You can't uh, ignore this point, but when you make questions, there, there are another option. He explained here. <laughs> And answers, you can just make the answers shuffle just for the answers. It is a good idea if you make this point. Shovel just for the options, I mean the answers. For example, multiple choice or true false. And this point, we can make just this point shuffled, not all the questions. Yeah, thank you. That is an awesome point because that will fix the problem in Google Forms. If you shuffle all yeah. the questions, and you have sections in your forms that can create problems. But if you only shuffle the answers to the questions, so your multiple choice A, B, C, or D, 
yes. different within yes. the question. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Right. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts? Okay, uh, who would like to briefly explain online proctoring? Wafa, go ahead. Uh oh, I saw Wafa raise her hand, but I don't hear her speaking. So I'm not sure if she's having an internet connectivity issue or if she accidentally raised her hand. It was by accident. I want to give the chance for others. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> also, there are two Wafas, so I can't tell if you're the same Wafa or the oh, other okay. Wafa. <laughs> Um, let's see, let's see. Um, Hadi, I know that you weren't here yesterday, but, and I don't know, maybe you're dealing with your children at this exact moment and it's fine if you are, but you spoke last week about online proctoring. Um, would you be comfortable speaking about it again today? Uh, hello and uh, welcome again. I'm totally sorry about yesterday. I couldn't attend. I had a lot of guests, so uh, I had to attend to that invitation and uh, be aware of that. Regarding uh, the way that we either call it invigilate, which is a physical invigilation, or online proctoring, uh, I have used a kind of like some techniques, but uh, I believe the success of each of these techniques depends on the numbers of the students that you have for each exam or for each assessment. For example, uh, in Google Forms, in Google Forms, we can add some add-ons. Up there to the right, uh, there is a button called Insert Add-ons. Uh, one of the add-ons could be a timer limit for the Google Form. For example, if you have a kind of questions that you believe students need 10 minutes, then make it 15. Uh, and give 15 minutes to the students. At that time, they will be only busy with answering the questions. They don't have that amount of time to search for the answers. This is one timer. Second, there is a camera option that you can add that add-on to the Google form. The moment that the students open the form, the camera will be immediately open, either th through their cell phone cameras or computer cameras. So you can have a visual uh to see your students this is one second which is more important it is going to record the video for you later on you can watch each single piece of video individually as if after the test you are going to invigilate again or proctor again this is second third inside google classroom specifically for written assignments that require students to write there is a checkbox which is called check plagiarism you can tick that box, which is the right down the button, and Google Classroom automatically checks the plagiarism ratio for the assignment for you in a report. Google does this for you for five assignments. So whenever you have five writing assignments, you can uh, tick that button and Google automatically checks the plagiarism ratio for your students. And you can have the reports later on individually for each student, which I believe is very, like it's a very nice gift from Google's uh, classroom. Awesome. Now, Hadi, I have a question for you. What uh, what add-on do you use when you proctor your uh, online exams in Google Forms? Which add-on do you use? Is well, it? Well, I um, use the, the 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 timer. There are two to three timers. Mm -hmm. uh, one is limited to only thirty minutes. There is another one. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, currently I use my uh, computer that I usually leave on Rhiney campus because I teach on two campuses. So I don't have my personal computer that I use that I've installed the, the, the add-ons. So I use the department's computer right now. If hopefully next week, if you're interested in that, uh, uh, next Friday, which will be on Ramadan, uh, I will be at home uh, and uh, I can share the add-ons, uh, and we can do that together later on. But uh, there is an add-on regarding the timer add-on, which makes the choice for you, whether you want two minutes, three minutes, 10 minutes, and so on. But there are some others that are only 
are uh, give you 30 minutes, no less than 30 minutes. This is one. Second, which is, I believe, uh, makes the add-on to be successful is that whenever you create a Google form using, for example, Google Chrome as a browser, you only open your account, your Google account on that browser. If there is any other, even Gmail accounts or an institutional account, the add-on is not going to work. So you have to sign out all of the other accounts, use Google Chrome as the only browser, and at that time, the add-on is going to succeed. Mm. I have I faced this previously. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for talk, for discussing that. Um, yeah, we talked, so we talked about uh, one add-on yesterday. Um, and the name of that add-on is Auto Proctor. Um, I'm not sure if that's the add-on that you use. There's another add-on. Uh, which I've posted to Google Classroom, but I don't remember the name of right now. Um, the problem with Autoproctor is after some time, you have to buy it. So it gives you, I think, 50 free tests to administer. And after that, it wants you to purchase Autoproctor. But within, mm -hmm. that, um, within that site or plug plugin or add-on, it will allow you to set a timer and it will also activate the camera to capture whether students are cheating or not. Um, it will inform you it, what happens if they um, open another tab, navigate to another website, um, and a couple of other features as well. Um, so we looked at one of those add ons actually. Actually, I'll save that for the next a little bit that we're going to do. Um, and you also spoke about plagiarism detectors in Google. Now, does anyone who was here yesterday remember the name of the plagiarism detector that we spoke about? It's OK if you don't remember it. Originality reports. Yeah, originality reports. Who said that? Uh, so no. Thana, yeah. Thana, have you used originality reports? No, in fact, no. Interesting. Has anyone here used originality reports? As a teacher or as a student? Either, actually. Yeah, when I when I was a student at the, uh, uh, when I was doing my MA, mm -hmm. uh, all the articles went through the originality report at the end of each semester. Mm. And um, did you put them through the originality report or did the institution? Yeah, there was a, a class with يعني, yeah, each uh, professor gave us the username and password and we uploaded them and we see the result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. That's a, yeah, so that's a nice feature for students to check. Has anyone else used them? Is this what you were discussing with plagiarism in Google, Hadi? The Google originality. Do you, if you don't remember, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Uh, it is the same. So it gives you a report. It gives you the links, mm -hmm. uh, the ratio for each link that the student plagiarized the text. For example, it tells you that this student has taken 10 10 percent or 20 percent from that link. Plagiarism without paraphrasing, without anything. It is the same. So it is, it is the same. It is a kind of originality report. It gives you the ratio of the originality of that assignment that the student uh, submitted in the inside Google Classroom. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, all right, well, so that's a recap of what we talked about yesterday, some strategies to prevent online um, cheating. And I'm going to, in a second, uh, send you off into groups so that you can discuss your own like thoughts, challenges, reactions, and questions. But first, I want to share my screen with you to just go over a couple of the features of Google Forms. Because when I was reading through your questions last night, um, there were a couple of things that I noticed. So first of all, has anyone here right now um, never 
created a Google form. It's okay if you haven't. There are many other tools that you can use online. Um, but I'm just curious, has anyone not made a Google form? Okay, all right. So um, that's easy. In our Google Classroom, there is a video link to a training video on how to make Google Forms to begin with. Um, but I just wanna come up here and go over a couple of ideas that were covered yesterday and I wanna review and some new ideas. When you come to settings, if you make this a quiz, you typically, so, and you want to make it a quiz if you're administering a summative assessments you will very probably want to select release grade later after manual review. If you keep it at its default setting, which is immediately after each submission, the students will be automatically notified of their score uh, and you won't have any time to review their work. And if you use a plugin like um, Auto Proctor or a timer, or a plagiarism detector, um, you will need the time to read what that report said about whether students were cheating before you return their work. So do I highly recommend uh, select later after manual review. Um, another area, if you think about cheating, is you may want to deselect correct answers because one way a student can get around cheating especially if they're allowed to take the quiz more than once is they can just quickly go through select um, any answer that comes into their mind press submit and if you have this box checked they will then see all of the correct answers to your quiz so then they can go back start the quiz again and copy the correct answers. So you want to probably unselect that so that they don't see the answers. Maybe for a formative assessment, um, keep it selected. But for a big final summative assessment, you probably want to deselect that. Um, in presentation, again, this is where you can shuffle question order. Again, um if you select that and you have sections in your quiz it might not be the best option um because it can mess up your sections and then finally in general uh you can collect email responses but you can deselect that if you would like to as well i don't usually collect my students email addresses because they can access the Google form through any account. It might not be their institutional account or the email that you associate with that student. Um, and so that can get a little bit confusing. If you limit it to one response, that can also prevent the problem of, oh, the students just went through the quiz and viewed the answers um, and then, you know, uh, retook the quiz and put in the answers that they saw was correct. So you may want to limit it to one response um, as well. So then down here, um, when we spoke about randomizing the answers, uh, when you come to a question that you've made, um, you want to click these three buttons or three dots and come down to shuffle option order. And that is where, um, that's where your students can see different orders of responses that are possible. One other possibility, sometimes students will copy and paste a question into Google. Um, so you, they could come here and just copy, where is Paris located if they don't know? right into Google and get the answer that it is in France and not in China and 
paste that right into the response bar. You can <clears throat> upload pictures to your question. So one way around this issue of students copying questions and then pasting the responses is to write your question in Microsoft Word and then upload an image of the question, which students can't copy and paste. Um, another thing that I just want to briefly discuss when you're designing anything online, right? It doesn't have to be your, um, it doesn't have to be an assessment. It, this is any aspect of online teaching in any field, really. You probably want to experiment first before you send anything off to your students that you've created, especially if it's new. But even if you have already used Google Forms a thousand times, you want to try it out first. So you can um, preview this, right? You can preview the responses. But what I prefer to do is send the link to my student or to myself. I send the link to myself to make sure the link works and to make sure that it um, appears the way I would like it to appear. Uh, you can shorten the URL of your link and that makes it easier for students to copy. Um, and then you can send um, in an email to your learners. Are there any questions or comments about using Google yes, Forms? Yeah, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's, it's the question of yesterday, if you remember. We normally use Google Forms for uh, MCQ question, that is for multiple choice and true false. So how about subjective test? How can we put a key answer for subjective test in Google Form? Of course, this, this will not be uh, possible because we don't have a definite answer for that because uh, you see now students can uh, vary in their own style in the way that they can answer a question in subjective test. This is one. Second, I may say something about uh, our trial just to avoid cheating as we do our best. Uh, I mean, to avoid cheating, students on their part, by the way, uh, if I say tricky students, okay, try their best just to hack the question. You know, uh, th there are certain programs in which the students uh, hack the question form in the way that they can know the key answer. So, uh, I mean, it is, uh, it is already done by some students, if I say. And for this, we, uh, we, we did something uh, we <clears throat> we did not put the key answer in the form itself. We put it as it is, and then once the students uh, finish the, uh, answering the form, we uh, uh, put the uh, the key answer. And in this case, we are not going to have students know what what key answer. And if they hack the question form, they cannot recognize what what is the uh, I mean the sample or let me say the key, the key answer. So this is, uh, it is a way to avoid hacking the question form and to know key answers. These are the two points that I want to raise. That's an awesome idea. And actually I have your first point um, scheduled to discuss in just a second. So that's a really nice segue. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again really briefly. And okay, so presenter view. <sighs> One day I'll click the correct button, maybe. All right, so we're going to move to breakout groups. Um, and in the breakout groups, you're going to discuss your thoughts on Kahoot, Google Form randomization, auto proctor, or really any proctoring, um, and Google originality, which is plagiarism or any other plagiarism sites that you use. And I, in addition to discussing your thoughts, I would love it if you share your ideas. So if you have a wonderful idea or tool for preventing cheating online, um, 
a great website to check for plagiarism, please uh, share it with your group because this is a wonderful way for us to build resources together. Um, and just a caution to remember while you're discussing, each of you teaches in a different platform, a different subject matter. Some of you are teaching language, okay? We're gonna learn English or we're going to learn French. Um, some of you are teaching language teachers, right? So we're gonna learn about how to teach English or French or Spanish. Uh, and some of you are teaching in very different contexts. So we've got people teaching 200 students live at the same time and people working in really small places. We've got people teaching in Kurdistan and people teaching in Baghdad. Um, so, uh, and the last note again about teaching in different platforms, um, whether you're teaching in Moodle or Google Classroom or uh, ELC or Canvas, uh, what platform that you use will determine to a large extent which specific tools make the most sense for you. Um, for instance, Google Classrooms, in my, in my experience, you, if your institution gives you access to Google Classrooms, then it's much, much easier to use some of these originality reports. Um, if you use ELC or Blackboard, which are learning management systems, they give you built into that learning management system a proctoring um, add-on and a plagiarism detector. So uh, just be aware that there's not one right answer here. This is subjective. Um, okay, so you're also going to discuss the questions in white below. Have you used any of these tools uh, or online tools similar to them? And what questions or concerns do you still have about online assessments? Please add them to our Google Doc. So when we come into our Google Classroom today, <clears throat> let me share my screen. When you come to the top of the page, it should say April 9th and 10th, and it has all the videos that we looked at yesterday. But the first thing in here is a Google Doc with the same instructions, right? And then uh, in addition, I have compiled themes from your questions that you asked in our writing activity at the beginning of yesterday's time together. Um, so the questions that I included, if I didn't put your question here, it's not because I thought it wasn't a good question. It's just that other people asked a similar question, so I didn't want to repeat. The questions that I already have here from you guys writing yesterday is how to avoid cheating, how can we put a key answer for subjective questions to be then corrected online through using Google Forms in making questions? How can we control the high number of students during online assessments? Oral examinations for a large number of students, 250 in one specific day is still a nightmare. Setting only multiple choice questions for subjects like linguistics is not fair enough to assess all students. How can I correct essay questions? What is the best and easiest tool? So these questions, I just want you to be aware that they are already here. And as you are discussing in your books, there we go, okay. As you are discussing in your groups, um, if you have questions or concerns, you're welcome to discuss these questions. But if you have, additional questions or new questions, I am going to ask you to add them to the bottom of the list. So let's say your group comes up with a question that's 
not connected to these questions that we already have here, which we will discuss together after you're in your groups. I would like them, I would like you to add them here. Do you have any questions about um, this activity? No? Okay. So to save or to manage time a little bit, I would like us to take our break now before we go into the breakout room, uh, breakout rooms, blah, the breakout rooms. Um, and then when we come back, we'll kind of carry on. Uh, Hiro, I see you're raising your hand. Did you have a question? Yeah, or is that for before accident? we go to the activity, uh, could you please just show us uh, when the pair pointed uh, yesterday and today? Did you post them yet or not? Oh, I haven't posted them yet. I can okay. post them really quickly if you want to have access to them. Um, but my plan was to post them after, uh, like later on today. But would you like them there? Yes, of course. Yeah, I would like now. Okay. So I will add those during the break. Um, okay. Oh, well, I won't add today's because today's isn't finished yet. Um, but I will add yesterday's. Okay. And, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to see you in five minutes.
Okay, so I'm going to open the breakout rooms um, and you can join them. I have a record. So if you get disconnected from Zoom, um, you can WhatsApp me or you'll come back here and I will reassign you to your breakout room. We'll start with 15 minutes to discuss. And then if you need more time, we can extend. Um, there might be a warning that the breakout group is going to close, but it won't close. Um, it, so you can ignore that warning unless I message you directly. Any questions before I send you off? Um, excuse me? Yes. Um, do we need to report back in the end of our discussion? Oh, great question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, All right. Yeah. So choose one person. So that we can divide rules. Yeah. Yeah. Choose one person who can report back. And for the other roles, there's going to be probably three to four people in a group. Um, I think the only role we like really need is who's going to do the talking for the group when we come back. Um, Good. Yeah. Great right, question. Any other questions? All right, I'm opening the groups. One second. Uh, okay, you should have your invitations. Okay, Mohammed and Allah, did you receive your invitations and are unable to join, or are you logged in on two different advices, devices? Okay. I'm going to assume that you're logged in on different devices. Um, if you need me or you need my help, you can type in the chat or in WhatsApp. And for now, I am going to uh, turn off my camera so I can monitor the phones.
because yeah. they have so much time actually the uh, time that is specified for the exam must be three hours and actually i think that this time is so enough to cheat <laughs> am i right yeah it's it's quite sure what you what you uh, what you said it's about cheating yeah 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 uh, yes I mean, so or, uh, i think sometimes we are wasting our time yeah. in uh, more than enough. The questions more than enough more than enough it's, it's uh, yes I mean, it's not the time for us. that. Yes, yeah. I, in my opinion, the exam must be for only one hour. Yeah. And actually, yeah. one hour is so enough because what uh, we examine them is merely true or false, multiple choices. Yeah, yeah. MCQ uh, question. All yeah. the students that they have to do is to write their names and to click the correct answer. So actually, three hours is so much time, Yani. Yeah. yeah. Is that yes. okay? Uh, I mean, uh, concerning. Uh, yeah, no, no, let us discuss it one by one. I mean, oh, it's uh, okay. it's finish okay. with point number one. Mr. Sorry. Sadiq, if you, if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, I think uh, I went through uh, Kahoot before. Uh, to be honest, it's uh, a good you know program or software to use for the students. I use it for a small group of students. Well, the problem is that we have a large number of students, more than um, 200 yeah. students. So if I try to group the students for, say, 10 or 15, I need more than uh, two to three hours to, um, you know, to use the this uh, for all the students. So I stopped using it. But um, I use the randomization within the Google Forms. If I have a um, you know, quiz of one section, if I have uh, more than two sections, I cannot use it. The auto proctors I use, um, I use the uh, the um, some something like um, stopping the mics for the students. Uh, the uh, for something for timing I use in the Google Forms too when I use the assignments and quizzes um, for the Google originality to be a different device or maybe mm -hmm. he gets help from another person so uh, let us go some of the attendees' questions that uh, they have asked on the classroom. Um, how to avoid cheating during online, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. online teaching or online assessments? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, last year I attended uh, a workshop with the university, uh, the American University of Dubai, I think, or Abu Dhabi. They have special tools for for minimizing cheating. Mm -hmm. yes. They buy it and they form it. Yani, alas, I, yani, they didn't allow us to, to, yani, to see everything, but said we formed this platform and, and there are many cameras, okay? And they depend on the movement of the student. If his head goes round, left, right, okay, immediately he will be out of the class and dismissed. All right, good. Um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, because I'm teaching uh, language skills and um, academic writing, I personally try to give my students questions. So I post my question on the module, on our platform. It's all about writing. Um, for example, write an essay about this and that. And then they send their work they send their work via email to me personally. Uh, who have who have been you know uh, uh, care less about uh, you know their uh, study and teaching process you know. Yeah, sometimes I try to uh, I try to uh, uh, to arrange four forms, for example, A, B, C, D. And, uh, and my, you know, it, it's, so, I think it's easy. And, it, and, I told my, and, and I told my student before the exam that uh, it is not the same form. We have four types of. Hi, Allah. 
Did you get kicked out of your group? Okay, Ala, I think you were, oh, I think you're having connectivity issues. Well, you know, uh, just I, uh, give your ordinal ordinality. Uh, I don't use it actually. Well, this but, is usually for, for recent assignment is very good. It's very great for recent so assignment. Depending on my subject, on context. So, my subject uh, or context it is different. Not need to take or uh, Google ordinality. I mean to check uh, plagiarism. Yeah, it depends. Yeah, so it is depend on the subject. Of course, of course, and usually, usually there is a kind of shortage of each of these uh, online uh, tools. For example, in our country, usually we have internet connection problems. So what happens? What happens if a student or a number of students claims that uh, we for example, the moment that we opened the test, the internet was not stable. So we could not answer all, all the questions and the timer later on uh, was uh, like, Hi, Allah, are you here? Oh, no. try to upload the uh, the lecture yeah. or that's yeah, the or same something. same they say that yeah yeah the Even uploading when you try to give a live lecture you mm. have to activate the big blue button we started to follow this way and after mm. about two months uh i received a notification say that you have consumed all your free sessions oh. so that yeah there's uh, only a limited space of uh, memory they provide mm. you with. I see. Then we moved to FCC again, and we start yeah. to give lectures, live lectures through FCC. Mm -hmm. Okay, writing ass assignments, like writing a paragraph or essay on a Word document, and then send to me on model. Oh, that's, that's an answer to the question? Oh yeah, sorry. Hello, I'm here. Hi. 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 Yeah. The blue uh the blue things are other people's answers. So um ah, I see. So you uh -huh. can just focus on the black. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Um and I'm going to I think unless you need more time, I'm going to close the room in about 2 minutes. How does that sound? No, it's okay. Oh, I think if we're we're good. Okay. okay. Maybe yeah, I'll make okay. it Maybe I'll make it three minutes. Um, okay. <laughs> all right. Can we control the high number of students during online assessments? Um, How can we control the high number of students? Ala, can you hear me? Were you able to join your room? Yes, thank you, Kathani. Oh, great, great, great. Um, 
who were you with before? Who was in your room? Do you remember? Yes, Mohammed and uh, Jabalin and uh, Hamid, I think that. Uh, maybe Nachirvan, Hamid, and Mahmoud? Yes, yes. Okay. All right, I'm opening, I'm putting you back in your room, um, but I'm, I'm gonna close the room in about two minutes. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, welcome back to the main room. I believe that you observed uh, our room for a while. I did. Yeah, I, saw, I saw you there. <laughs> I did. I joined each room for a little bit um, just to get a sense of the discussion. Um, and it was very interesting, the things that I heard. So I'm looking forward. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing back from you. Uh, OK, I think by now everybody is back. So in the first group, we had Ahmed, Amani, Mohammed, and Sadiq. Who's going to uh, share with the class or the session um, what you spoke about? In particular, I'm yeah. interested in learning about anything that we haven't talked about yet, um, any new tools or resources, or any new questions. So go ahead. Yes, Ms. Amani will, will, will report back what we have for room number one. Thank you. Hi, everybody. First of all, we are going to talk about Kahoot. Actually, uh, Mr. Hamza and me haven't used this uh, activity before, but actually we are interested in uh, applying it in the uh, few days coming when we start the second semester. God well, actually, Mr. Sadiq has used the Kahoot with his students, but actually the problem with using the Kahoot is the large number of the students. So, uh, Actually, he said that he needs to repeat the same game for more than one time because of the large number of students. 
uh, for sure all of us use the Google form. Me, uh, sorry, Mr. Sadiq and me use the Google form with randomization, but actually Mr. Ahmed uh, actually didn't agree with us in using the randomization because uh, he usually focuses on the seriousness of the content of the questions, neither uh, on the uh, randomization of the forms. Actually, concerning the auto protector, Google originality, Mr. Sadiq used the auto protector for uh, add ons for timing and other things. Actually, none of us use the Google originality. Concerning the second question, have you used any of these tools? Actually, me, uh, Mr. Sadiq, and me used uh, something that is called turn and turn our papers. Because when we want to uh, publish a paper in any magazine or any uh, journal, for sure, we uh, seek for the originality. And we have a, pro a program that is called Tone and Tone in which we submit our papers in order to see the ratio of the uh, uh, plagiarism. So actually we use some, something that is similar to the Google originality, but something that is called Tone and Tone. That's, uh, uh, actually, Amani, sorry, one second. What is it called, Turn and Turn, T-U-R-N? Uh, turn it and, sorry. So T turn in turn T U R N mm -hmm. turn it in turn. This is a, a program in which we submit our papers in order to see the ratio of the uh, plagiarism. Is it free? That Sorry, Amani. Tur turn it in. Yes, turn it in. Turn it in. What what a wonderful resource. Yes. Is it is it free? No. No. Actually, ah. nothing is free. <laughs> we have to pay. <laughs> How much is it? But actually, it doesn't cost a lot. Okay. It doesn't cost a lot. Okay. It depends on the times that you are going to submit your paper. Sometimes from the first time, your paper may, may be uh, of less uh, plagiarism. If you have a high ratio of, of plagiarism, so the uh, program is going to notify you. So you are going to change and rewrite some paragraphs with high ratio of plagiarism and you are going to, to submit your paper again and for sure you have to pay. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. That's yes. really uh, interesting. Actually concerning this, uh, the third question, we do not have any uh, new questions because for sure you already answered us with all the concerns concerning the questions of online assessment. That's all and thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. How interesting. Yeah, you guys have such good resources. Um, the next room was room two with Ala, Hamid, Mahmoud, and Nechirvan. Who's going to report back from your group? Uh, hello, Kathleen. I think we didn't decide who's going to report back to the whole group. Okay. Uh, if they let me, I'm going to share some ideas with you, Mr. Mahmoud and Mr. Nechirvan. Can I? Yes, go ahead. Yes, okay. I mean, go ahead, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm not gonna go through every point we talked about, but uh, something which is interesting to me and was interesting to my friends was about auto proctoring, the, the software or any other uh, uh, softwares we might use to um, uh, minimize uh, the cheating students might uh, <clears throat> Do, uh, during the exam uh, process. Uh, well, uh, there's a question here. If you leave the camera on, yeah, that's fine. We can uh, invigilate or proctor every activity the student uh, might uh, does during the test. But how about if you have a large number of students, like 100 students, how much time do we need to, uh, again, watch uh, individual students' uh, videos or recordings and to make sure that uh, nothing happened during, uh, I mean, malpractice, nothing like mal malpractice happened during the test. Uh, for example, if you have 50 students, not 100, uh, and the time of the test is 30 minutes, all right? So you need 25 hours to watch every student's uh, recordings, okay? So, I mean, that's a great point. Um, but one thing that I want to mention about these proctoring suites that you can buy or add-ons or plugins, or um, they actually generate a report for you. So you don't have to watch your students' videos, um, 
what comes up in the report is um, like a notification that at this point in time, your student moved. And then you can click on that okay. and see what they did at that moment. Um, wow. So what you get is a report that you can read through. And then you can click on like instances in the that the report identified as maybe problems. And they're not necessarily problems. And then you have to go in and look, OK, what exactly was the student doing? Um, yes. So I think that's interesting. Uh, I think if, this, if we can buy it or if the university can provide it, uh, provide us with that kind of uh, program or software, it's wonderful. It's time saving and uh, we can manage it, even if you have a, a, a big number of students in the classroom. One more thing, uh, the first group talked about Turnitin. I think this is one of the, like, one of the best tools to use to check originality of uh, assignments and reports used by uh, uh, universities in the UK. I think almost every university uses this software uh, uh, and they provide links to the students when they try to uh, uh, submit their papers, submit their assignments, and it quickly gives you a report how much you have plagiarized, was it intentional or, uh, or not, and uh, should you like um, redo it like take it back and uh, change something or you have to just submit it they allowed us like 10 percent was fine if it was not intentional and if it was like quoted from other sources it's a very wonderful uh software if uh, my my friend nirvan said that uh, his university provided them with with soft this software it's great really it's used by uh, universities in the UK. And I used to submit my purpose and my assignments before, uh, like before actual submission, I had to uh, upload it to the web software, software and in two, three minutes, it gives you a report. If it's fine, then you can attach it to your paper and then submit uh, your assignment, your essay, whatever it is. Thank you. That's. Uh... Those are all great ideas, and it's interesting to know, Natchervan, that um, you in you were provided that through your institution. Um, um, yes, yes, uh, they've bought the annual subscription, and every year they knew it. So uh, actually, every teacher, every faculty member, they have rights to use it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's turn it in. Yeah, turn it in. Turn it in. Wonderful. So if um, I know you're all kind of in different positions in relation to your institutions, um, but one thing that I recommend doing is doing some research on your own just by using Google, right? Uh, mm -hmm. What comes with your learning management software? You all have a learning management software, right? Google Classrooms and Moodle um, are both learning management programs and find somebody at your university who might be able to answer the questions for you. Can we have access to a plagiarism software or a proctoring software through the institution? That's pretty standard practice um, in the US. And as schools move online more and more across the world, um, it's it would be a good thing to advocate for within your university if they don't already have it, but maybe they do, and you can you can contact someone and and ask. Um, great. Okay, in room three, we had Hakar, Hosan, Mohammed, and Tana. Uh, right. Yes, I, I will report back to you. Uh, actually, in our group, we discussed some questions, which I will come uh, later. But the things that we use, the platforms, we used uh, Google Education platforms like um, Google Form, uh, Google Classroom, and my colleagues used uh, randomization in order to minimize the amount of cheating. Uh, also, Mr. Haukar's uh, university used Turnitin, uh, although it's not free for the students. Uh, they buy it, as uh, Mr. Hamid and Mr. Nishirvan mentioned. Uh, but we discussed a very interesting point, actually, in our group, which is a cultural problem uh, of sharing 
the correct answer between the smart students and the students who never read. I remember when I was a student, I didn't want to share any correct answer with my friends during assessment or during any test because it was my right. I, I studied a lot and I didn't want to share that. Uh, and it was not a um, you know, reasonable thing to do. But nowadays, uh, not only me, my colleagues also had the same uh, issue. We see that the smart students in a class, uh, outside the class, I mean, they share the correct answers together. They have groups. And Mr. Haukar saw something on social media. And uh, he said um, they check the correct answers during online assessments together. They have another group like maybe they have a WhatsApp group or Viber group or any other uh, accessible groups. Uh, that's why technology is, has a disadvantage actually, um, let's say point here, because uh, it makes things easier for them in some ways, which is good, but in the same time, it uh, helps the students who never read, who never try to get any new knowledge or information about their uh, reading. So um, this, this topic came out from uh, the question that uh, Mr. Muhammad said, can we have uh, a type of question uh, in order to evaluate uh, the smart students or the, let's say the students who read more than the other students? Because uh, sometimes we have to make the question standard for the whole level, for example, the first level, but there must be actually I agree with him in that point. There must be some questions that make a differentiation between the marks, the grades at the end for the students who read and the other students who want to cheat actually. Uh, but in that case, the let's say the students who read a lot will help the other students hmm. outside their online class. Because as we discussed before, um, we don't. We cannot force them to open their camera. Mm. Is it clear? Yeah. So I'm sorry. I'm just thinking about what you said. That's that's a really interesting point. Um, Hosan, I have a question for you, which is, uh, what do you teach? Like, what what subject matter are you teaching? Well, my MA is in English literature, but I teach uh, right now. I teach uh, in the first semester. I thought uh, it was reading and writing, but the second semester, which will uh, begin in these days is listening and speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Um, so does anyone have any responses to that? I, I've been thinking about, I have some responses, but does okay. anyone here want to share any responses to okay. the concerns? Can I say and... something? Yes, who are you? Where? Uh, Mahmoud, Mahmoud. Go ahead, Mahmoud. Yeah. Uh... I think with multiple choice, uh, my uh, colleagues for the for the master students they said a multiple answer, multiple answers a question, in which the student, and in this way you can, يعني, differentiate between the good one, the one who reads a lot, and the one who, who is not reading. The multiple answers, the students must choose more than one choice, not just one, two or three. Mm. Multiple choice, but multiple answers, you mean? Multiple answers, yeah. Yeah. No, That's a think. good idea. Um, that yeah. is a good and idea. And it works well in my department, especially with the MA students. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other ideas or insights into this question or problem? So one thing that I was thinking about as Suzanne was describing this is um, Asking higher order questions. Yesterday we talked about the uh, revised Bloom's taxonomy, right? So when you have multiple choice answers, those are really useful uh, mm -hmm. if there's one correct answer. But if you're teaching students um, the skills of speaking, listening, reading, and writing, or um, or English literature, if you develop questions where students give, I think what a lot of people in their questions called a subjective response, where right. they have to craft their own response with their own analytic thinking tools, um, then 
that is another way to reduce this problem. Because if I asked each of you, for example, assuming that we had just read the same text, for instance, Romeo and Juliet from Shakespeare. If I asked each of you to write a response um, explaining um, in your opinion, um, what is Romeo's main character flaw? You'll each have a different opinion. Um, and then when I ask you to explain it, you will each have a different reasoning for your decision. Um, so when I then evaluate my students' answers, it can be pretty clear to me, okay, they all said his main flaw was pride. That's not logical. 30 different people wouldn't choose the same character flaw and 30 different people certainly wouldn't give the same three main supporting reasons. So then you can tell your students, I'm sorry, but this looks like cheating. You all fail. <laughs> or, you know, you, you have an opportunity to do this again. Do it again and don't copy. Give me your own ideas. Um, how does that sound to you? Thank you. Yes. Yes, actually, I, I'm planning to ask my students for the second semester subjective questions, even if it's for speaking skills. Mm -hmm. um, because as we discussed previously, um, it, it, it reduces actually the amount of cheating and they, they might be more interested in talking about their experiences with something rather than, uh, uh, let's say, objective idea about any other uh, question. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you, uh, it's, it's useful. I may, I may add something. For, uh, I mean, uh, multiple choice, we can do multiple choice with, with some sort of application rather than having direct uh, answers. It's just like when, for example, uh, when we have essay writing or even paragraph writing, we give students a paragraph. We say that there is something wrong with this, this paragraph. Is it, is it about coherence? Is it about unity? Is it about inconsistency of, of the subject? So here, only those who can apply these things can have the answer. So this, this needs some sort of experience rather than just to have a direct answer in which students can, can realize this from the book. So this is what we call a, a question which is outside the book, outside the material, but it is what applicable an application of what the students study. The way that they have, uh, let me say an example, they can conclude what's wrong with it. But uh, here we have choices. Still we have multiple choice. It is not a subjective test. It is an objective, multiple choice, but the correct answer needs some sort of experience rather than cheating. And if, if students cheat, they, they are going to cheat wrongly because Unless they they have experience, they cannot do the the, the right answer. So what do you That's, think? That sounds like a very good strategy as well. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And yeah, I, could... I did it by the way. I did it. I did it for for my own examination. And did and it I work? I told you yesterday about. Oh, uh, and a lot of students failed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kathleen, can I add another point, please? Don't you think that I'm so happy for that? But you see now, <laughs> you're so happy <laughs> that your students failed. <laughs> well, here, 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 just to prove that if you if you are uh, uh, aiming just to what uh, to, to reduce or uh, eradicate, if I say eradicate cheating, uh, I mean uh, uh, you have to uh, focus on the content of your questions rather than the technicalities that we talked about. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, okay. those are great ideas. Uh, yes. Can I add Hamid? another point? Yes, Hamid, Hamid go ahead. And yeah. then I think Hadi maybe has uh, something to say too. Okay, yeah. good. I just remembered something. There is a type of testing. Uh, I don't remember its a specific name. If I remember, I'll share it with you. Uh, the, 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 it's a computer-based test. Mm -hmm. And when the students take the same test, Maybe the first question is the same thing, but the next question and the coming questions uh, are depending on the previous answers. So all the students do not get the same question 
uh, throughout the process or throughout the exam. It directs them to di uh, different questions depending on their answer, whether it's going to more difficult or easier. Uh, I think it's, it's a great idea if you can use it uh, because it's a computer based and it's totally fine with online assessment. Oh, that's actually a good point. A lot of standardized tests use that even to calculate your final score, where as you answer questions, it gives you either more challenging or less challenging questions as you yes. go along and affects yes. your final score. Um, I have never built a test like that. So that's, I, I don't know if anyone else knows how to build one of those, um, but that's something that I can look into and maybe uh, see if it's easy or difficult. I know you can, in Google Forms, there's an option to go to a different section based on answers. So that might be a way to build that in Google Forms, but I would experiment with that before I sent it off to my students. Um, yes. Great idea, Hamid. Um, Hadi, did you have something to add? Well, uh, as usual, uh, like on Saturdays, I don't have amount of time till five. So uh, I will add my comments with a question. Okay, mm -hmm. and later on, I will be out of the meeting and I will look at your answers regarding the question. Uh, up, to, up to this year, up to the moment that I haven't taught ELT in my classes, I had a different point of view regarding my students. Even now, I believe it comes from the very beginning regarding students' mindset. Why do we usually, all of us, have to think about our students cheating, our proctoring, and the ways that we can like manage things to prevent these stuff? It is very hard to like to deal with this at the university level. But since we are teaching, for, for example, I am teaching students to be teachers later on. I usually teach my students to trust their students and to build this kind of relationship, like trust trust relationship between teachers and students from, from the beginning. Later on, when they get into university, their mindset is set in a way that they enter the class for learning. They don't enter the class for passing. I will uh, give a very personal example. Those who are from Kurdistan, they may know Salam Nahosh Bakir. I don't know whether any one of us is in the meeting that knows Salam Nahosh or not. Yes, I do. Yeah. This this very gentle person taught me on BA and on my MA classes. One day we were second stage students. He asked the, all, all the class, those who are not interested, those who are not in a good mood, those who, are, who have not prepared the lesson, please go out. And I promise you that I will not count you as absent, okay? So don't sit in a very bad mood that you don't have a very good mood to listen to me. At that time, you don't busy your classmates, you don't busy me as a teacher. So at that moment, about 10 students, they were out of the class. Second week, he repeated the same technique. About eight to seven students were out. Later on, the amount of the students who were like getting out of the class were, were low in, where you know, the amount was less. So after that, one day, he conducted a kind of meeting inside the class. He asked those students who were out of the class. He asked them why you went out. Well, they said, we were not in a good mood. We didn't want to listen. Then he asked them, how did you feel out the class? They said that we asked our questions, why we are here at university, why we are out of the class, then why the teacher asked this to do that. So they, questions themselves and they responded with responsibility. They said that since we are here at the at college, then we are here for learning. Since there is, there, there is no attendance, there's no absences. At that time, the teacher intends that we have to attend the class for learning, not for passing. This is a very, like, after that, I, like, uh, all the students, all my classmates are now, they can share the same, like, the same, the same event. All, all of the students, the ratio for attendees for moms that, for Mr. Salam now horses class were the most students of it is compared to the other teachers. So the students in that person's class, they were attending for learning. So my question is, 
why don't we start this kind of movement? Why we don't talk, uh, talk to our students why you're here? Why we always, for example, said, though myself, I myself, I know a lot of like tools and techniques to prevent plagiarism and proctoring and, and so on. But I usually question myself and I usually tell my students, think about why you're sitting inside the class. At that time, the first class could be difficult. The second meeting could be also difficult. But later on, I believe the same student is going to question herself that why the teacher is doing this. I believe this is the question that uh, I'm like, we, you can talk about that. Uh, it is about students' mindset and how teachers, how we teach our students later on to teach the, the very small children, because the majority of our teachers now, we are teaching students. We are teaching, for example, students to be teachers later on in the future. So our students are going to bring students for us to university. At that time, if we teach them with a the correct mindset, I believe they can send because it is a kind of cycling. They're going to send students to university. They're going to teach students. So they are going to send a very helpful students, like a student that attends the class for learning, not for passing. Mm -hmm. This is the point. But I'm, I'm I, very I, sorry. I, I, I'm I, only I do 10 agree with you. To enter to university campus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. So, Hadi, you have to you have to go teach your class right now, right? Yeah, yeah. I have class on five, so I have to prepare and uh, enter the campus. Okay. Then, well, thank on, you. For I will listen to the discussion again. Okay, so that mm. I will have your comments later on. Okay. Thank you so much, Hadi, for sharing that. We appreciate You're welcome. it. You're welcome. Um, yes. Yeah, somebody wanted to respond to that. Ahmed. Uh, I, I, yeah. I said I do agree with the points that are raised by. Uh, Mr. Hadi, this is briefly, this is our role as educators. This is our role as educators. You see now, regardless of uh, things that we talk about, you see, it's, it's about, uh, I mean, uh, the usefulness of learning. Okay, uh, why students uh, are here as, uh, as, as, let me say, as learners, why? What for? Is it just to pass? Okay, to, to get the certificate, so what? Here, here we need we need usefulness of, of learning. Okay, you are going to be a graduate. And what to do with? Is it just to say that I'm graduate and that's it? No, you have to prove yourself. So this is, you see, we have to implant these, uh, these ideas on, on their own minds. I mean, on the part of learners. This is our role as educators. So we are not only teachers, we are educators. We want just to, um, I mean, have, uh, uh, let me say some sort of models, uh, or let me say modeling teaching when we talk about this. We need just to uh, uh, emphasize the idea of usefulness of learning. Why, why do you learn? What for? Just to, to, to get the certificate and that's it? Or you need just to prove yourself this is this is the question. Great. This is what I, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, and those are really good points. Um, those are excellent points, um, and they're kind of essential philosophical questions um, and practical questions in the field of education. You know, ideally, our students, particularly at university, are in our classes because they have a passion for our subject right, because they really want to learn and excel as practitioners and professionals themselves. In practice, that's not always true, right? Some people need go to college because, you know, their parents told them to, or they need this certificate or degree to get this specific job. Some students are so concerned with their GPA. Um, I will share a story with you from my own online assessment. Um, and I'll contextualize it by saying, so right now I'm teaching a course at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, um, and it's a course in second language teaching methods. And our department met at the beginning of last semester to discuss student stress during the pandemic, right? Uh, the pandemic has been stressful for so many people, you know, people are have lost loved ones. They've been cooped up alone in their apartments. They've been concerned about um, themselves and their families. There's just been a lot of stress. So our department decided as a whole to be um, forgiving 
to students in this this particular year, right? So um, we're granting a lot of extensions, extenuating circumstances. We're trying our best to help our students get through the semester rather than saying, well, if you can't meet these things, you have to leave the course or our program right now. And this semester, I had a very inter interesting interaction with one of my students who earned 100% on every assignment that I had given her. And on maybe the seventh assignment, she got two points off. She received an 18 out of 20, which is still a very good grade. Um, and she called me crying about these two points off out of, you know, I mean, she would still have an A or a 3.8 GPA at the end of the course. So Students are also very emotionally attached to their grades. Some see it as a piece of self-worth and some see it as a barrier or an obstacle to their professional careers going, going forward. So it's also really important to consider how our assessments affect our students emotionally because um, it can impact their persistence in our course, whether they stay in college or not. At the same time, though, I'm not going to give my student two points back because she called me on the phone crying. Uh, so th these are things to balance. Um, OK, we have not finished our debriefing. Um, I think who, which groups haven't spoken yet? Hero, Hero, did your group report back? Hero Hussein and Maria. I think one four. Uh, it was just Hadi who was about to uh, talk, uh, report to the group. So I think he talked. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And then we need group five, which was Ban, Wafa, and Wafa. Yes. Actually, uh, we don't have much to share since there are a number of other groups who mention much things about um, the answers for these questions. But generally speaking, uh, uh, me, uh, Wafa, and uh, Ban have discussed whether we used Kahoot or not. All of us, uh, the answer was no, we don't use Kahoot for official assess uh, summative uh, or formative even um, assessment. Uh, we always use Google uh, forms for our uh, test, whether they were qu as a, uh, daily quizzes or as a monthly exams. Yes, uh, we were all interested about uh, Otto Proctor and uh, we are looking forward for next week, inshallah, since Mr. Hadi promised to provide us with the links and uh, discuss more about this topic and how to add these uh, new features to Google Forms. Yes, concerning Google originality, uh, we don't need this uh, tool for use for use them since we don't teach uh, essay writing or uh, things which are literary topics. Uh, we all be using uh, Google Form for MCQ and such stuff because these tools, I mean Google originality, is related to writing, and since we don't teach writing, so we don't need it. Um, we try to answer a question such as how to avoid cheating and how to put <clears throat> answer. Concerning this question about how to put answers for subjective questions, uh, we think that the only way is to uh, to grade these uh, answers manually. There is no other uh, way for solving su such issue. Um, how to control uh, a high number of students. Uh, actually, the only way is to try to divide them into sections or groups, uh, especially if you have oral tests or uh, such other types of tests, we can uh, solve this problem by uh, dividing them into groups and we try to uh, repeat the, the exam more than once. Yes. Thank um, you. Yes. Did you These have anything? The, Anything more to add? No, no, these are the most things that we focused on. Awesome, and I really appreciate you going through those questions at the end, um, and which we're gonna turn to now briefly. Did, did every group get a chance to report or did I miss a group? Okay, so 
that was a wonderful bridge. Uh, thank you for talking about these questions. Um, I, as I said before, transferred your questions um, to this Google Doc. And then in blue, I included some responses that I think already answer these questions. So in terms of putting an answer key for subjective questions, um, yeah, if a question is subjective and has more than one interpretive response, then you can hand grade your questions and not use uh, an answer key. Um, I wasn't sure exactly what you meant by subjective questions, but now, now I understand it a little bit more. Um, so I was thinking also of these responses, like problem solving questions. That's a great way to ask subjective questions. And subjective questions are a great way to make sure that you're really assessing students' learning instead of students' ability to copy other people's answers. Um, this is a wonderful example. Uh, giving students symptoms of a particular disease and asking them to predict the causative agent of the disease. What a great question. If you ask them to add their rationale for how did you come to this conclusion, that's not an answer they can copy from one another. Um, Great. And here are some other good answers uh, to that Kathleen, question. Can I add a point about this question? Mm -hmm. uh, from what I understand, uh, I mean, from this question is that maybe he or she is asking about subjective testing, uh, the type of testing we have. We have subjective testing and objective testing. The subjective, subjective testing are those types of tests uh, which require different answers. The students have to answer, for example, like an essay or a paragraph writing. So the, the answers will vary. We cannot provide key answer or answer key to these questions. As you said, we have to manually uh, score the, uh, the answers. Mm -hmm. So uh, here we need to judge. Uh, there's judgment uh, involved. Uh, no matter how many times you read the answer uh, at the end, even if you have a rubric, you have to judge how uh which score is fair to this answer and which score is fair to a different answer uh, so here if i answer this question correctly there is no answer key to subjective testing yeah and i love that you added the idea of a rubric um thank you that okay so well, that in fact in fact this is this is my question mm -hmm. this is my question and when we talk about we cannot answer subjective test, or we don't have key answer for subjective test. Okay, so how about making objective and subjective tests in one in one test? How can we manage these things if we don't have key answer for, and we have final examination, and we have a, def, a definite or electronic correction, electronic correction for MCQ and subjective? How can we manage for that? So I think you would have to, if you're using Google Forms, you would yeah. have to not include an answer key, and then you would manually grade your questions. But that, so to me, that question yeah. is not really unique to online teaching. That's also a question in in-person classes. So how did you do that when you were teaching in person? Well, I, I, I did it uh, electronically in the way that the students will uh, upload files in, uh, for answers. Uh, that is, they can answer uh, through uh, Google Sheets, mm -hmm. or even they, uh, they can answer, uh, I mean, they can have paper answer, and then they can take photos for, and then to be uploaded to me in the class. And that's why I did it, I did it electronically. But uh, for the correction, I downloaded all the answers and I corrected this manually. Yep, this and it would be the same online, <clears throat> right? You'll have to correct it, it manually. Is not, it is a through, it is a through uh, I mean, uh, uh, let me say uh, electronic tools, but uh, I mean, it is done then uh, manually because you see now it's, 
it's a matter of uploading and downloading files. And this one, uh, and uh, by the way, this is something very tiring, you see? So imagine you can download 189 answers one by one, and then to download it on papers and then to, to correct it manually. You see how, how, how much time that you, 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 you cannot imagine that I spend a month just to, uh, to finish with, uh, with all answers. Right, thank you, Ahmed. So that's a concern, right? And that's a reason why a lot of teachers do use uh, answer keys, right? Where there's one right answer. It's because it reduces the time that the teacher has to spend correcting. But if you want to include essays and subjective questions, like you are going, that's not, that means that it requires your brain to evaluate the response. Well, I, I, I believe, I believe it, depends, it depends on the material itself. Uh, suppose that you have an essay writing material. How can we manage with MCQ only? You have to, uh, this is, this is uh, uh, something which is related to writing. And writing is a productive skill. We need some sort of production rather than just to have something to recognize. This is something to produce. That is, students should write, should uh, uh, have their own, uh, let me say, uh, answer in the way that they can answer subjectively rather than just to, uh, to, to have multiple choice or true false. I say yeah. writing. Yeah. So it, it sounds like you have answered your own question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, did someone have anything to add? Yeah. Yeah, I can uh, think, yes. Mm -hmm. Who is that? Yeah, it's Mahmoud. Mahmoud, yes. What did you want yeah, to add? Uh, the, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, the, the, the questions like that, the, I call it the uh, questions which enhances the creativity, students' creativity, I usually ask them in, in campus, okay, in person questions. Okay, to evaluate, for example, the poetic, uh, the poetic technique for, of this poem. Or sometimes I, I use proverbs. For example, I have a Little Black Boy by William Blake, and I, I, I give the students the proverb, all that glitters is not gold, for example. Mm -hmm. I say comment on this proverb referring to the poem, Little Black Boy by William Blake, for example. But in online, in online exams, I usually ask students, uh, true, false, uh, multiple choice, and fill in the blanks. Oh, why? So why do you change online? Well, actually, what I do, I do both. I mean, I'm, I'm just before before the workshop. I've or I'm, I'm manually correcting my students' answer. I have in my Google form. I have uh, multiple choice questions, true, false questions, and fill in the blank questions, and also uh, write a small paragraph or a long paragraph because we have options. Which what type of answers do you want? So five of the questions. Uh, sorry, four of the questions are right. Uh, two are write a short answer and two write a long answer. These, these are only the four questions that I manually correct. Other, the other questions are corrected uh, automatically by the Google form itself because I've given the correct answers for them. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I can manage both. Oh, thank you. That's a great idea. Right. This is what I'm doing, actually. <laughs> right, 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 right. If you change the question format, so that you have an open-ended question, then yeah. yes, you yeah. can. Yeah, I mean, in the, options, in the options, you have what, what type of answers do you like? Would you like it multiple choice? Would you like it true, false? Would you like it a grid and blah, blah, blah. And, and then you have long uh, answers and short answers. So you can choose one of those and they can submit their, their answers in that and you correct them manually. That is a wonderful idea, Wafa. Thank you for bringing that in to the discussion. <laughs> Uh, Kathleen, I think you can also use Google Docs uh, for any open-ended question or essay writing. Uh, Mr. Ahmed, uh, uh, let me share my experience with you. Uh, in last semester, I asked my students to write a paragraph. So I wrote down the, the writing prompt, the question in Google Docs, and I uh, uh, submit, uh, assigned my students to answer and to write their paragraphs. So I didn't need to uh, uh, download all the answers when they turned in their answers. I just clicked uh, on the piece of information 
the, the, the mistake, whether it's a grammar mistake, punctuation or whatever it is, I just click uh, on the word and I could write down the comment or the correction for my students. Uh, so I didn't write, I didn't have to download any, any answer. I did it totally online. Uh, just like uh, any Microsoft Word, <clears throat> you use uh, a file, you just comment on anything you want, just uh, go to review and add comment. Whatever you want, you can comment on it and you can uh, send it back to your student without downloading them. And uh, Yeah, and you can highlight even the things that you would like. You can, yeah, That's true. You can, you can do everything yeah. uh, you can yeah. as well in, in Microsoft Word, uh, Word file. So it's time saving and it's totally, I think it takes less time than if you do it uh, manually, if you download it uh, and do it manually. It takes less time. But what do you think? What, what do you think? Which is more, more, more accurate? I believe paper correction, manual correction will be uh, more accurate than uh, online correction. Because you can't, you see, especially when we talk about a large number of students, okay? How can you read? I mean, you see now, even if you, if you are accustomed just to read uh, through, uh, I mean, using your laptop, but you see, it's even tiring for your, uh, I mean, eyes just to, uh, mm -hmm. to look uh, at each answer and then to highlight. But when you have it on paper and you correct it uh, uh, manually, I believe that it, it would be better. Okay, I'm going to have to stop you there. Hira, I see that you have your hand raised and I would love to listen to your response. Um, can you keep your response under 30 seconds? Uh, I haven't any comment, but I would like to remind you, I sent you uh, the uh, message about the changing the time. Yes, we have exactly. a Ramadan, yes. And that is what I want to move on to now. So these are all wonderful ideas. Ahmed, what you're talking about is a question of preference, right? Actually, working online is just as accurate as working in person if you have the skills and confidence to work online. So that's a matter of practice, and we can talk about it in a second. We can continue this conversation next week, but, oh, my dog is back. All right, she's going to cause problems. Um, but before we go... Ramadan Mubarak, everyone. I know that Ramadan. Thanks so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much. You. Oh, that's yeah. very sweet. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> um, I know this is an important time, and you'll be preparing your um, your to break the fast uh, as soon as the sun oh, sets. So. Um, Hiro did text me to ask if we could move next week's course so that both Friday and Saturday begin at 2 p.m. Iraqi time. Does anyone not want to do that for any reason? Because, for instance, you have a different commitment earlier. I believe that we, we all fine. agree about these things. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm talking about myself, so I don't have any problem with that. Okay. Yeah. If anyone, okay. um, if anyone has a problem with it, can you type it in the chat or text me on WhatsApp? I am so sorry. I have to go now because I'm in charge of my friend's baby shower. And if I'm late, there will be no decoration. <laughs> um, so okay. I have to okay. go. But, then enjoy um, our time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Please uh, feel free to message me. And I think we're going to change the time next week to 2 p.m. on both days, unless I get a message from somebody saying like, oh, I can't do that because I teach a course and I have to move. Um, but for now, let's plan on that. And thank you so much if, um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm going to go now. I will see you next week. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.